Hello, good morning, Firecatchers. This is Andrea. It is March 9th, and we are in the Firecatchers classroom. We're talking today about uh, just changed by worship. And I would love to start with uh, just some prayer, and then we'll move into the, the teaching uh, this morning, and then we'll have share some testimonies a little bit later, all right? So, Father, thank you for this time. Thank you that you have set up this the ability to to worship come into your presence to be changed in the worship and and i just thank you for every story that each one of us represented here has for each story that we've heard from other testimonies and the stories of the transformation that is still yet to come and so we bless your name um this morning we ask for that the words that you've that will be uh, will be um, that will be your spirit will your spirit will take it and and sow it into our lives and that worship uh, for those that are already into worship and that we are worshipers that it will just resonate with with what our what you have already been telling us in Jesus name amen so let's talk about so we're talking about worship I could talk about worship for hours. I was on an, in another group and someone else had asked, uh, what could you talk on for 30 minutes without any preparation? And worship, hands down, is one of them. And there's so many different aspects of worship. I think, I think when I started the preparation and preparing this, I was going in one direction. And then kind of what I ended up with is a little bit different than what I had thought the direction was going to go. Um, I think that that's all good. I like, I believe that that's Holy Spirit just leading and guiding. So I'm going to trust that that's what, that's the teaching that he wanted to, to leave with us. So when we talk about what worship is, I did not look it up in the dictionary. I actually made my own definition up. And I remember, I, I, I still have flashbacks to to university when I was writing papers and I would not cite a, I actually had my own thought and, and I wouldn't cite something from another source. And the, the, my professor never liked me to have my own thoughts <laughs> about anything. It always had to prove someone else had thought this before me. But so when I look at worship, I didn't look it up. This is what, this is the definition that I came up with. It's any act, word, or thought that recognizes who God is and causes you to submit and surrender to the revelation. It requires you to be present and in the moment. You must linger, reflect, and become contemplative, but it does not mean silent, stealth, or still, although it could include that. So it's not just the the revelation of knowing who God is because even the demons know who God is, but they do not worship. So it's the act of submitting and surrendering to it and lingering in that place, which is why we can actually come into an entire lifestyle of worship. It's not worship is not an event. It is not the slow songs before the fast, the praise, or it's not the, the slow songs always come after the praise, right? The praise, the worship, and then the sermon. It's an entire lifestyle. And so when, we, when we're talking about worship and being changed by worship, it's not an event, although, it's a, although it can be series of corporate times and concentrated times, it's the lifestyle that we're, that we're looking, that we actually want to focus on. And, and the focus is on on understanding a revelation of who God is. So what you focus on, you become. So it's in the process of becoming Christ. And so welcome, Anita, if you've just been joining us, we're, we've just started. Um, so, and we're talking about being changed in the worship, by the worship, and through the worship. I think I didn't actually like the whole, that I had to choose one for the teaching title uh, because each preposition is a different topic and we really, we could explore it individually, uh, what it means to be changed in the worship, by the worship or through the worship. But this morning we're going to have a 10,000 foot view of what, it hap what happens to us when we worship. So when I was in high school, um, one of my teachers used to be famous throughout the school uh, for administrating 
only true and false tests. Like he didn't have any other kind of test. It was just true and false tests. And, but his test had a twist. For every wrong answer, Anita, I'm just going to mute you for the purpose of, the only reason is I, that I muted you is, or anybody, is because when we're recording, uh, any background sound goes, okay? So if you, and, it, and again, I just wanna reiterate that if you have any comments even throughout, feel free to, to unmute yourself and speak, okay? This is, this is not a, this is not just a, a, me sharing with you. I want this to be collaborative as well. But he, the, so, okay, so he had tests. His tests were, were when you answered a, if you had a wrong answer, it actually subtracted from the number that you had right. So unless you were absolutely sure about the answer, it was better to leave the answer blank than to guess, because a guess an incorrect guess actually cost you. And so subconsciously, I know that it taught the students who had been through his class to, that taking um, an action that might be wrong is better than, uh, that doing nothing is better than, than t having a wrong answer. But really that's not the case. Doing nothing is as transformative as doing something. On adversely, I think JFK, I, I looked up this quote and JFK is quoted with it and so with a bunch of others, but whoever said it is the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is that good men do nothing. And so it's not about, if you are not um, doing something you are still being transformed. So our topic is trans the transformative power of worship. And if we're, um, so yeah, why are, we, why are we talking? Why did I try transgress into this? You and I, all of us here in this little circle of, of worshipers, we're worshipers. We're connected because of worship. We, uh, worship is your, your normal lifestyle. I know this because I know I know most of you, and I'm getting to know uh, a few new ones to, this morning, which is great. Um, I always say, I've said for, my brother actually used to always tease me about saying this, that I need to worship like I need to breathe. It is that important to me. And I know that that is your heart as well. Worship, it's necessary for life, and especially active worship, um, such as dance or worship flags. We engage in worship, our body, soul, and spirit are all working together during uh, worship. And quite honestly, I have, uh, uh, now Kim's on her call, she is so active, and I am not so active, but when I have, when I was in Bhutan a couple of years ago, we were, the purpose of the entire trip was for worship. We were there to, to worship in the heavenlies, worship in the region and, and change the atmosphere through worship. And um, we hiked up to Tiger's Nest uh, Temple, which is a Buddhist temple. It's probably the most famous temples of in Bhutan um, and one of the most famous Buddhist temples. And it's really, it's literally on the side of a cliff. And so it's eight kilometers, which a round trip and it's virtually up. And so I, every step that I was taking was an act of worship. It was an aggressive act of worship even though i did not have we had flags with us but i did not have my flags in my hand i was not singing i was i was <laughs> i was in a grimace <laughs> and with every step but it was an act of worship so it's not it's it's not about what you're doing it's about who you are and i knew the purpose of what the trip was so it was i was engaged in my body in my soul and my spirit we were all working together um to to worship so i know that you will okay agree that anti worship which actually is fear and that's another topic we won't be talking uh, going back into that but 
fear, it's detrimental to our well-being. If anti-worship is detrimental to our well-being, it feels like rebellion. So Lucifer, remember Lucifer, the archangel who was heaven's worship director before the creation of our world, he rebelled against worship and we, we know what happened to him. He, he was cast out of heaven. Um, but what happens when you don't worship? So we're, I know we're talking about the transformative changed by worship, but I, but I really felt that we're going to start with, well, what happens if you don't? And then we're going to move into what happens when you do, because something is happening either way. And so when you don't worship, well, if what worship adds something to your life, then anti-worship has a negative consequence. And so there is actually no neutral zone. It's, it's either worshiping or not worshiping. Um, and it's actively not worshiping. It's a, it's an act. It's, it is, it's a subtraction. It's a subtraction of blessing from your life. And we can, we can look through scripture through this and that's what we're going to do. So if you're not moving towards God, you actually are moving away from him. When I was younger, we used the word, I, in the Christian circles, the word backsliding was very, very prevalent in, in our, the Christian speak. And I don't know if I'm just not in those circles, but I don't hear that word very often any longer. Um, it may or may not, but it described as a person who was walking away from God. We kind of all knew what that, that was, but the compound definition of that word actually means to slide. It's not an active movement. So they were not walking away. They just weren't walking forward or, um, now you might be thinking, well, what about standing, standing firm? The idea of, because then you're not moving forward. Uh, but conversely, when you are standing firm, as Ephesians 6 tells us to stand firm, and in many script scriptures tells us to stand firm, it's actually being rooted. You are not, you are not, it's not loitering. So there's the difference between standing firm and then and loitering. So on the surface, it appears to have the same look. You're both just kind of standing there, but one is rooted and one has no aim. So really, that's what happens in worship. There's no neutral zone. When you don't worship, you're actually removing blessings. So my high school teacher had it wrong. Uh, taking no action is, is the same as inac inac incorrect truth. Sorry. Taking no action was the same as incorrect truth. Um, I'm going to read 2 Samuel 6, uh, 16 to 32. This will be the basis of our school of our morning scripture. Now, as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through the window and saw David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. I'm just going to... Ariana, just I'm going to interrupt for a second. I'm going to make you the host, okay? So that... Can you um, just mute anyone who comes in? Okay, thanks. Let me read that again. Now the ark of the Lord came into the city of David. Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through the window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Then he distributed among all the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both the women and men to everyone, a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. So all the people departed, everyone to his house. Then David returned to bless his household. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how glorious that the king of Israel today, uncovering himself in the eyes of the maids of his servants as one of the base fellows, shamelessly uncovers himself. So David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me over the uh, to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord, and I will be even more undignified than this, and will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maidservants of whom you've spoken, by them I will be held in honor. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. 
So earlier in the scripture, if you're familiar with that story, um, she actually it says the scripture says she loved David. There's in two in two passages. It says she loved him. First Samuel 16, verse 20 and 28, was said that she loved him in her with all her heart. David and Michael's relationship was a difficult one and they had many problems. So we're not going to get into their, their problems, but she harbored resentment. And her love for him had actually turned to despising him. She had gone from loving to despising because of their problems. Now, Matthew 24, taken out of context, I, I know, but it does tell us that, the, that when you harbor offense, the people, when the people are offended, their love turns cold. So here's what happened for her when she was, she wasn't part of the festivities. She was out of community. So I think that we've chatted in the fire catchers group about being part of community and um, whether you're part of a church, there are lots of us that aren't. I'm actually not part, part of um, a consistent church, a weekend service church, I, but I am in relationship. So it's removing yourself out of completely out of relationship is you don't have the benefit of, of the, of the corporate accountability of being um of checking your heart in the in the in the catchphrase of john chris check your heart uh you have to be in community you have to be in community to do be able to do that uh because you start to get a warped sense of of what is accurate so personally i really actually struggle with being told I need to worship. I don't agree with anyone who says that we were born to worship. It's, I think we were birthed out of love and relationship. We are created for relationship and to know God, but it's in the knowing God that we worship him. So when you know God, it's the only, res it's the only response. If you, so, so I can see why it becomes, we were created to worship because those, because when you know God, you will worship. And so they are missing that middle, that middle step, but, um, cause it is the fruit. Scientists have really tried to engineer uh, fruit in a laboratory. They've almost been successful or in, I mean, really they are, they have been successful. We all eat uh, genetic, genetically modified food. They have been, they've created to, find something that looks like fruit. Um, but the GMO fruit, what is produced outside of relationship, has no ability to sustain life. There's nothing that is self-propagating about the fruit that, that is created outside of the relationship. So everything that God does produces and perpetuates life. So when we are connected to him, we don't actually have to engineer fruit out of our life. It, the, the worship, that, that's fruit of, out of a relationship with Jesus, um, with Holy Spirit, with Father. That actually comes as it just, it happens. Um, so Michael was out of community. She looked out the window and she despised David. Her love was dried up. She should have been part of the festivity. She should have been part of what was going on and participating in that. Uh, secondly, she was jealous of the maidservants. So jealousy is an indication of a poverty mindset. It means that you, that you think that there's a finite number of blessings. And then when someone gets a blessing, it detracts from your ability to have as many blessings because there's less to go around. It's a poverty mindset. So, so David and all the people including the maids and servants were celebrating together. They were in corporate worship over the presence of the Lord being in their, in their midst. But when you're outside of community, you are jealous of the passion of those who are inside. You are outside of being able to be part of that community. You have no sense of self worth within that. You have to have, you have to hold on to something else. You're, you're limited to what you can engineer yourself. 
And then thirdly, um, what happened to her when she wasn't worshiping is that she was barren. We talked a little bit about fruit already, but atrophy occurs when you don't use your muscles, right? When a patient is bedridden, a physical therapist will still come and work with the patient to keep the muscles active. So if you've ever been in a cast, I don't think they actually do this quite as much anymore, but when I was a kid, when you had a cast, you on on a limb uh, for about six weeks however long it was um really you could tell as soon as that cast came off you could tell like the difference between your muscles in your in a leg or an arm um your muscles really atrophy you actually shrivel up and so um her her womb her ability to bear children which is a blessing of the lord um and i think that 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 actually is the it's a physical reality of a spiritual dynamic so she it was far greater and far uh, more harsh of a of a punishment really for her that she didn't that she didn't bear fruit because it was spiritual when when um like her father her father had the blessing of the lord had the anointing of the lord and then he removed the lord removed his blessing and anointing from him but that didn't actually mean that saul at that time ended his kinship his kingship still continued for another 17 years even though that he was he was not in the position that god wanted so what we're what we're talking there was a spiritual death right that happened for Saul there was a spiritual cutting off of of the blessing and likewise his daughter when she didn't acknowledge who God was and and participate in the community she was caught caught off and it did not perpetuate life uh so likewise Romans 1 um 18 to 25 let's read that now I'm switching over to the to the passion. For God in heaven unveils his holy anger, breaking forth against every form of sin, both towards ungodliness that lives in hearts and evil actions. For the wickedness of, the, of humanity deliberately smothers the truth and keeps people from acknowledging the truth about God. In reality, the truth of God is known instinctively, for God has embedded this knowledge inside every human heart. Opposition to truth cannot be excused on the basis of ignorance because of from the creation of the world, the invisible qualities of God, of, of sorry, the invisible qualities of God's nature have been made visible, such as his eternal power and transcendence. He has made his wonderful attributes easily perceived, for seeing the visible makes us understand the invisible. So then this leaves everyone without excuse. Throughout human history, the fingerprints of God were upon them, yet they refused to honor him as God or even be thankful for his kindness. Instead, they entertained corrupt and foolish thoughts about what God was left. This le left them with nothing but misguided hearts steeped in moral darkness. And then switching over to just down to verse 28. Um... And because of they thought it was worthless to embrace the true knowledge of God, God gave them over to a worthless mindset to break all the rules of proper conduct. And so here's another um, example of what's happening when we're not, when they don't, when we don't glorify God for who he is and um, recognizing God, i.e. that's worship. It leads to crap thinking and you actually can't recognize him. So it actually distorts your thinking so much that you have an inability to come come back into a uh, relationship. Remember Pharaoh? So first he hardened his heart, the scripture says, and then scripture says that God hardened his heart. But did God, did God really harden his heart or did he just lift off his restraining hand in this, in the, um, how did I, in verse 24 of Romans 1, it says, this is why God lifted off his restraining hand and let them have the full expression of their sinful and shameful desires. And so, um, Pharaoh, so going back to the Pharaoh, he 
hardened his heart so much to the degree that God lifted his hand. I think that that's just a terrifying thought to me is when we go our own way and God lifts his hand off of us because then we, then we are at the mercy of our own con of the consequence, all of the, the full brunt of the consequence of us, which is a, which is a, the NIV says a crooked and depraved mind. Um, but it's not a right mind and the spirit of God is, is, is a right mind. He's, that's what he's, he's given us a, a, um, a sound mind. So if you don't know what God's will is, his thoughts and his plans and his action for a situation, the antidote is worship. Romans 12, 1 to, 1 to 2 says, tells us that. But for the life of a, tra a transformed life, positive effects of worship, we're also going to look at David. You, I'm sure you knew that, that we were going to go there. <laughs> So what can be said about David? And this can be totally interactive. I have a little list. What can be, feel free to jump in all at once. <laughs> Some of his resume. So what do we know about David? Well, the main thing, they say that he's a man after God's own heart. And, yeah and so and that he made mistakes I mean that's the thing I always like to remember is the chronicling of him not being perfect but also being after God's heart <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I do actually like that he made a lot of mistakes because that's not that's not the issue isn't making not making mistakes it's it's he he went after God's he his heart he wanted to know God's heart he wanted to know God but some of the other things too like he would he, there's so many things that you can say about King David he was he was um he gathered people together he had obviously a, a very dynamic dynamic and charismatic manner about him that he could take the roughest tumble of guys a whole bunch of rednecks and make them into mighty men he he also uh, uh, united the North and the South kingdoms. He killed Goliath. He said, it says that he also killed a lion and a bear with his own hands. He was a man of integrity. Um, but all, and through all of it, it doesn't, I mean, we have the book of a lot of the Psalms we know are from David. And so some of the, the preamble to the book, to the songs that we have in the book of Psalms, um, tell us when he was, had written them, but undermining all of it is that he worshiped, like it was a lifestyle of worship for him. So it wasn't a one event of worship. Uh, it was a constant revelation of who he was. And so he recognized who God was and his and he desired to know him more. He wanted to linger with God. He wanted to worship him. So I'm going to read, go back and we're going to read first Samuel six again, and then we're going to read the entire chapter. Um, okay. And then we're going to end. Well, it's still quite a bit, but that, that's, we're going to end with this passage. Um, again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went to the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called by the name, the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. So they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out to the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Uzzah and Aho. I should have read reread this. <laughs> when I have to read these words in Bible, <laughs> so different in my head. Um, so he brought it up out of the house of Abinadab, that which was on a hill, and Uzzah and Ahu, Ohio, I think, the sons of Abinadab drove the new cart, and they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, accompanying the ark of God, and Ohio, ah, Ahoyo, whatever, went out before the ark. Then David and all of the house of Israel played music before the Lord and all the king kinds of trumpets of fir wood on harps and stringed instruments on tambourines on sistrums and on cymbals. And when they came to Nahon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand of the ark and 
and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error, and he died by the ark of the Lord. And David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, How can the ark of God come to me? So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him to the city of David, but David took it aside to the house of Obed Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed Edom the Gittite three months and the Lord blessed Obed Edom and all his household. Now it was told King David saying, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went up and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed Edom to the city of David with gladness. And so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Then David danced with, before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up, brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of trumpet. Now, as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through the window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt sac offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Then he distributed among all the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both the women and the men, to everyone a loaf of bed bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. And so all the people departed, everyone to his house. Then David returned to bless his household, and Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the maids of his servants, as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. So David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord, and I will be even more undignified than this, and will humble, be humble in my own sight. But as for the maidservants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. So in stark contrast, we're looking at David, and then and we've already looked at Michael, and now we want to look at David. So some of the points that I had gotten out of this, and there's so much that has been messages we've heard before, but so much we've, we've, you've probably already heard, but as I was, as I was studying this, um, I, I found a, there's four points, four main points that, that I caught out of this was that God, he recognized who God was and was bold enough to think that he could be in a relationship with God. I think that's the key. He was bold enough to be in that, that he actually ha could be in a relationship with him. So are you the kind of person who is both awed by the Lord, but bold enough to think that you can be in a relationship with him? The, the, there's, there's a lot of Christians who understand the sovereignty of God, but they don't understand the friendship with God. And part of a, a real relationship is 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 both David had a real relationship God and if you've never gotten mad at God and had a disagreement with him then do you really have a relationship the the, the beauty of it's not about messing up and being worried that you've messed up and that you have to run from your father a, a great relationship is that you mess up and you run to your father I have right? You, you can't, I can't stress this enough. It's out of relationship. If we're, we're born for a relationship, do we actually believe this? Because if you don't, it will actually hinder your, your worship, your ability to worship. You have to have a conversation with God and you have to, you, you have to be able to be mad at him. I, I have a friend who, who loves God and she's, she's, She's just lovely, um, but I've, but there's there's an insincerity in it that she's always saying, "Oh, God is good. God is good. God is good," as if it's a mantra. Um, I'm like, you know, I mean, that's the truth, but I don't always feel that. I'm like, <laughs> and so I always love my husband, but I don't always like him. I don't like what he's doing or whatever. Like, 
in relationship, there's the ebb and the flow. You have the constant relationship that never, if you're committed, but you will, you will never have a very healthy relationship if you can't express all of who you are. And I love that about David is that he could express all of who he is. Um, and again, if, if he's making us into the bride, um, I can't imagine being in a relationship where I couldn't speak my mind. If my husband didn't want to have know what was on my mind, um, then I'm a servant. And so there's a lot of Christians that live as servants. Uh, and so we start there, then we move into sonship, and then we move into um, a spousal relationship, which is, which is true intimacy. And so I think David is an excellent example of that. So we learn that from him. It's the purpose of our existence is for relationship. And he was in relationship. He included everyone. So at the beginning, when I read, he included the choice men of Israel, 30,000 of them. And then he ran into some trouble. And I'm not going to get into some of those, the things that he got into trouble with. Um, but... Then it says he brought the ark back with all of the house of Israel. So there was, there was an elitism for at the beginning. And then when he, the true worship, the worship that the Lord honored and blessed is, is that he brought everyone into it. So worship, corporate worship is, um, brings everyone and all of their baggage came with it too. We're not, he's not afraid of that. We're, uh, and if we're, um, and I, I have to check my heart with this one. I actually found that this one was probably something that the Lord was dealing with me in, um, oh, they don't worship like me or they don't have the same freedom. And I didn't, you know, you know, like there's all sorts of, of ways that I have separated myself from certain, certain groups of Christians um, because they don't worship like I do or what. It's not, a, it's not about, if worship is a lifestyle and I'm in relationship, it really it shouldn't matter. Um, that shouldn't be how, what defines the worship or inhibits the worship, not defines. It inhibits the worship to flow. He included everyone and they celebrated together. It, worship actually expands community, which is such a beautiful way of transformation. It actually opens you up into, into greater fulfillment. Now, there are, uh, I know at least three or four of you are, are introverts. And, yeah. <laughs> and, um, but what I also have no, what I know of, of you, it also, you are moving into more relationship in and through worship. Now, Jen was telling me that someone was used her flags, <laughs> you know, to be able to share, to be generous. I mean, this is the transformation and it come, brings into the next point that everyone received from the bounty of the king during the worship. There is a generosity that is happening. Generosity is the transformation result of worship. Instead of a lack or poverty mindset, which Michael exhibited, trying to protect what you have. Um, and we have the... So what you have actually is then um, can actually be taken away. Like think about Saul's kingship. It was taken away. He didn't worship in what he was supposed to. Um, the parable of the three servants who have one talent, two talents or five talents, the one who had one and buried it. They, he was, they, he was not generous. He was not, he was not willing to risk what he had. Um, and then I was actually also reading Ananias and Sapphira that I, I actually want to read this. No, oh. did I? Acts. I forgot to mark it. I'm so sorry. Give me a second. Okay. Um, in Acts 4, now this isn't necessarily talking about worship per se, like the event of worship. 
um, but the, the early church had, had, uh, they had one heart and one mind. And it says in verse 32, this is chapter four of Acts, selfish was, selfishness was not part of their community, which is such a beautiful statement to be not part. It was their, that they had everything in common, meaning they shared everything. And then in contrast, this, this story that follows chapter five is about um, Ananias and Sapphira. And so they didn't have everything in common with them. They held something back, which was perfectly okay, but they lied about it. And so they actually paid a great price for, for their lack of generosity. Um, so the idea that, that um, everyone receives from the bounty of the king. And then finally, and this is probably where I, where I thought we were going to go um, in worship, not everything else that I have said today, um, was that he, David, knew who he was. He said, verse 21, so David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all of his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore, I will play before the Lord. I will be even more dignified than this and will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maidservants of whom you spoke, and by them I will be held in honor. And I think that the, the most beautiful aspect of being transformed um, changed by worship is knowing who you are and not not changed into what like a before Christ to an after Christ this is what we are being changed what you focus on you become and so if, if what you are if you are worshiping um, and focusing on him you're lingering the revel revelation of of the Lord is before you you are acting on it you are lingering on it and you're in submission to it you will be changed by that worship so the so the um again john chris check your heart do you guys know what i'm talking about when i say that yeah <laughs> my family as a side note, my, we're going actually to see him in two weeks. I'm so excited, but my my boys don't don't know who John Christ is, so I've just been talking about check your heart all the time, and I think they they think I'm being patronizing. To them. Um, but at this time, that I mean, we have other stories in scripture that we can we can point to. We I have a testimony of transformation as well about being in changed in scripture. Rosie, if you've ever heard Rosie talk in our group, in the Firecatchers group, about being changed by worship, she really has a great story. Um, and, and I wanted to say one thing before, there's, there's Rosie's story is, is radical. Um, it literally saved her life. But every story, every story is radical. So if you don't have, if you think that you don't have that kind of a, a testimony, I want to say that you do. We are changing every, every transformation is radical. I, I went from my own little testimonies. I, I mean, there's so many, there's so much, but the, the, I just, I just started to discover who I was and the discernment and discernment. I've always, the enemy is really, really, uh, would really attack me on the area of discernment that I had no discernment that I didn't, I couldn't, I didn't, wasn't spiritual. I'm not a feeler. I'm, I'm, I'm really not. I'm much more of a, on the personality scale, I'm a, I'm a thinker. You'll always hear me say, I think instead of I feel stuff. Um, and so I thought, no, I like successful Christians are feelers. They, they, they get what the spirit's doing because the spirit is much more emotional and, and, um, and so through the worship, I, that was something that the Lord started to heal. And I was transformed in that, that I understood who I was and I love, he is so confident. And I remember thinking when I started to worship, particularly, um, with worship flags. So I'm talking worship flags specifically because that's where I started to come alive into worship. It's not that, that only worship flags is the only way to do it. It was for me though. This was the thing that happened for me for some, like for my husband, he plays music and that was transformative for him. But I remember at that moment when I was in, uh, 
nobody was around. I was worshiping. I would worship all the time by myself and um, started just to call out who God was and, and say things against the enemy, which was not my typical way of doing things. And I just felt uh, like a little dog with a big dog, like talking smack to all the other dogs in the dog park. And because he knew that he had a, had a protector. And so it really put a boldness in my, in my spirit and, and who I was um, even greater than it was before. And so that's just kind of some, we all have these, these testimonies, even Saul, what, which Saul changed, um, he would have evil spirits visit him and then David would worship and play. So even when we are worshiping, this is the power of worship. When we are worshiping, we are actually changing the environment for other people so that they can be transformed as well. And so for the moment, I'm going to pause the recording. Father, I just wanna say thank you for this time and sharing stories and testimonies and how you, we take this thing that we get to have a revelation of God and a revelation of who you are and it's, all about you and yet somehow this is how we're changed that we're changed in this worship because um i mean without a doubt it's because worship brings us right before you and it it allows us to see you as you are and therefore see us as we are because we are created in your likeness that we are created um in, in your image. And so this is the transformation is to come before you and to, to be who we were, who you created us to be. Um, and so I thank you that we get to worship. I thank you for this group of fire catchers that love you, that we have this passion together, um, yeah. that you've put us together. You've made this, you've, you've made us to be, um, like a community, like what David had said, when all of that we had everything in common and that we can share in just generosity in thought, word, and deed, and however that looks, let us, let us move forward, continue to transform us, um, and that we might share our stories, that we might actually transform the environments and the atmospheres where we go. In your precious name, Jesus, we, we worship you, we bless you. Amen.